Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining me once more for an episode of Mindshare Matters. Today's guest is a really special human and a really special friend, Frank Maylett, who's quite an icon here in the Utah tech scene. Uh, anyone who's been in Utah tech for any time has heard uh, the, the name Frank Maylett. Uh, I rarely go away talking to Frank, even if for a brief moment, without learning something uh, pretty impactful about life and business. And I'm quite certain that you will learn something today from his amazing wisdom. So please join me in a few moments with Frank Maylett. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Mindshare Matters. I'm so excited to introduce you to a longtime friend of mine, uh, Frank Maylett. Uh, Frank has been, uh, we were just talking about what the right word here, so I'm going to say icon. Icon, Woo. Of, that, that's a good word, right? An that's icon powerful. of Utah Tech for many, many years, and we've been friends for a very long time. It's such a pleasure to have you. Well, thanks, thank you. Thanks for making the hey, time. Hey, th thanks for having me here. It's. Uh, Always an honor to be in your presence oh, and spend time with you. And, and I like the intro of Icon. That's pretty powerful. And I think for Father's Day, we'll uh, have my kids get me an Icon t-shirt or something. Go. I don't know. <laughs> Although that's quite an overstatement. I'm just one of the guys working in this valley. That's yeah, good. Whatever, Frank. Yeah. Um, I always love to start from the very beginning because I'd love to give those who follow Mindshare Matters some perspective on these impressive you know, very creative, very capable humans who frequently have really humble backgrounds, really humble beginnings. And I'd like people to appreciate that about someone as, as, as successful as you. So please take us to the very beginning where you were born and raised and the circumstances and so on. Yeah, happy to do that. Um, um, going back, there's no question that I'm a veteran. I'm an aged veteran. <laughs> so, uh, um, I, I came across the plains with Brigham Young back in the 1800s. Is that, does that play? It I don't sounds know. about right. Yeah. <laughs> Some days it feels about right. You know how after you have a really busy week and you look in the mirror and you think, like, oh my how God. am I still alive? That's, uh, that happens at times. So now born and raised in Salt Lake City. Uh, my father was from Manti, Manti, I Utah. I had forgotten the Sand Peak right. connection. Sand Peak right. County, baby. Yeah. And my mother was from the Ukraine. And they met uh, when my father was in the military in Atlanta. And uh, I've got uh, one biological sister and a couple of step siblings. And uh, we, we live down around the Liberty Park area in Salt Lake. And then uh, ended up moving later up around Cottonwood Heights. So I went to Brighton High School in the uh, University of Utah. And Met my, my sweet wife, uh, who's from Park City, at a dance club. Wow. Yeah. They had those back then. They All had, right. They had those back then. Uh, uh, in Park City or in Salt Lake? In Salt Lake. They're in Sugar House. And uh, I thought she was amazing. We, we dated for three years. Got married. And uh, at the time, I, I was working in, in retail. I was working for a local company called the Camera Den, which I probably remember. none of your listeners will ever remember. I remember that, yeah. But uh, we, we had branched off after about two years. I was running as a managing a Salt Lake operation and we decided to get creative and we, we thought, what is an industry that we could apply the same discipline to and disrupt an industry? So we decided as a, a group to go after uh, mountain bikes this would have been about 1989. Amazing. And we started a company called Gorilla Bicycle Company. And we, we uh, just caught on that front lip of the, the mountain bike craze. And we ended up having a bunch of stores, grew ourselves in two years to be, I believe the sixth largest bicycle chain in the country very, very quickly. And it was a lot of fun. And I, I used to do, little, little known fact, I was the radio voice 
and I de- did some of the TV commercials. So Seriously, I was. Seriously, uh, I remember Gorilla Bikes. That's amazing. Yeah. You were the radio voice. Yeah, I'm famous. So if you'd wow. like an autograph after this, I, we could do I that. I realized you were famous in the 80s. That's yeah, amazing. Yeah, way right? back then. Yeah. And, you know, when it came to mountain bikes, gorillas kicking their butts was our tagline. That's right. So very disruptive back in the 80s around uh, not only cycling, but, but around the market. And I um, had a couple of kids. Uh, we were doing well. And came home one night and and my wife made a comment to me and said, listen, the kids haven't seen you for two weeks. Because in retail, um, you know, you're very busy from early to late and it was the rush season and all kinds of things going on. And at that point I had a personal reckoning that I had to get my priorities straight. Had a buddy that was in tech. He worked for a company called WordPerfect and he was constantly coming after me saying, you got to come over here. It's way too cool. Tech's going to be the future. When is this, Frank? This would have been uh, 92 is when I joined WordPerfect. Wow. And I ended up, I ended up leaving the, the bicycle business and, and joined WordPerfect, took a, about a 50% pay cut and uprooted the family and we moved to New York. So, so even in 92, they had operations outside of the state. I oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They were. In fact, if you think about WordPerfect, 92 was about the start of the demise for WordPerfect. That's when things like the Microsoft attack and, you know, all the things that were oh, happening right. really started going. Right. So I, I got in on the, on the tail end of that, that craze. But I uprooted the, the wife and, and two small children. We moved to upstate New York. And that was the start of the tech career. So... How was it uh, growing up in Salt Lake as a Utah boy with San Pete connections? We're going to talk about the Ukraine side in a second, but yeah, and and going to the University of Utah and so on. What did you see uh, the New York opportunity as? Was it this exciting? Let me go out and adventure, or was it? Did it feel? Yeah, no question. I I think my wife would agree. It was quite an adventure. Mm-hmm. You know, she had a, a large uh, set of siblings and from Park City, very close family. But one thing about about my career is I married the right woman. She was up for the adventure and she was willing to make that that move across the country, dragging a couple of small kids in tow and let's give it a shot. And and the adventure continued for many years, but we'll talk about that later. But, you know, it was it was very, very uh, exciting. It was challenging. I mean, think about what what you live on today, what your salary is and how much you make. Yeah. And we literally took a, about a 50% pay cut to make this change because I knew that I had to, at, at times in my career, it's a reoccurring pattern, I've known that I've had to step back to step forward. And so it was never really about the money. It was about the opportunity and about the change and, and bluntly about family priorities and, and making sure that, that uh, I could provide effectively for my family in the future and I could spend you know, a reasonable amount of time, the right amount of time, raising my two children that, uh, that needed a dad. So it was a good change. Met a lot of great people. Uh, Steve Schmidt was a, a great mentor at, uh, at Camera Den and Gorilla Bicycle Company. He was the kind of the owner, president, CEO, CEO and, and uh, Marilyn Oakey. Mm. And we were, that was, my, that was my first lesson in sales training. We hyper-trained on sales methodologies, you know, how to qualify customers, how to close oh. customers, and to this day, I, I credit a lot of my my success in in those early days of, of Schlock and bicycles. It was pretty crazy. You, you know, you you bring up the point about uh, stepping back halfway to step forward. You're absolutely right that sometimes you have to do that. And I see people a little later in their career making those calls. It's uncommon for a young person to make that call. Young people are typically uh, might have a little bit less perspective on the importance of, of what you just mentioned. So what did, did you see something in WordPerfect? Did you get guidance? How, how did you make that decision? That's a big, that's a big deal. You know, that, that's a great question. Yeah, I had guidance. I had, you know, my friends and, and those around me that uh, uh, would talk about, you know, technology and, and bluntly how WordPerfect, you know, was a great place to work. And it had a good work-life balance. And again, that was one of the primary things I was looking for. And I don't think at the time I was hyper-focused on building a tech career. Mm. I didn't think, <clears throat> I'm going to make this change. I'm going to cut my, my pay and we're going to move across the country. 
because I'm going to make a trillion dollars in the future. Um, it was really more around immediate decisions and needs at that time. But I recognized one simple thing, and that is that it wasn't a solo decision. You know, it was it was spending time in consultation with the wife and friends and deity and, you know, all the things that you need to help direct your life and, and coming up to that choice and, and looking back, I, I wouldn't have changed a thing. I mean, it was the right choice. You know, unfortunately, Camera Dan and Gorilla ended up going out of business. They burned out pretty quickly. A couple wow. of years after I'd left, um, we had no indications that was happening when I was leaving. So it was a, a bit of a risky move at that time. But, you know, it's, listen, sometimes you just step in it. Sometimes you make good choices for the right reasons and they end up being incredible choices. And that was one for me. That really started my career. Frank, one of the themes that I have with a lot of the guests I've had so far is growing up, they felt out of place or that they didn't fit in. I'm curious, you growing up in Utah with Utah ties from the beginning before New York, did you feel like you fit in? Did you feel like you were you, know, you were one of the people or did you have any other sensations? No, I, you know, it's, it's funny, you know, what does fit in mean? Mm-hmm. Does anyone really ever fit in? But I, I can tell you as a youth, um, I, I, I never quote unquote fit in. Mm-hmm. I always kind of carved my own path. I wasn't, uh, I'm not uh, suggesting I was a renegade or a trailblazer, but, but, you know, I, I wasn't of the predominant religion here locally. I came from a, uh, a very um, you know challenging youth where you know my mother uh, you know we can dive into this as deep as you want or I can just gloss over it but being from the Ukraine uh, being a little bit older she she was conscripted into Nazi work camps your mother yeah my mom wow. and she ended up emigrating to the US through Ellis Island with uh, working for a, a sergeant uh, a military officer as a housekeeper in Atlanta. That's where my father had met her. Wow. And she ended up taking her own life when she was young. So my father sorry. remarried and uh, married uh, a, a great lady. And, um, you, you know, th- this could be maybe an Oprah segment. I'm we so could go sorry, into this. Right. Yeah. But, it, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, it's not the typical upbringing. Mm. Father goes to prison, single mother, stepmother raising us, welfare, you know, all that kind of stuff. So... So it's interesting, one, one, one quick story um, that, I'll try not to get emotional, because it's really a funny story. It's, uh, it's but, okay to bet. Yeah. get emotional if you need to. Like yeah, so okay. you, you know, I remember being the kid in school with tough skin jeans. And for the old mm-hmm. folks that remember, tough skin was kind of the discount brand from Sears. And, yeah, yeah. and, and all the other kids had the cool clothes, right? And, and I remember uh, one of the drivers in my life has always been running out of fear. Mm-hmm. And I remember telling my wife when we married that my kids will never wear tough skin jeans. Oh. So I single-handedly, with six kids, put Sears out of business. <laughs> <laughs> it worked out beautifully. That's why the Levi stock has done well. But, you know, it's going back to your question about fitting in. No, I didn't fit in. I, I, it, was a, it was a different upbringing. But what it taught me um, was independence. What it taught me was grit. I remember as a kid coming, you know, living in a, a very meager situation. Mm-hmm. You know, we were the sub for Santa family kind of kids. And, and I remember selling greeting cards door to door when wow. I was, you know, 10, 12 years old just to make money and paper routes. And, you know, that work ethic around getting things done and making things happen. And if I could go back and change my childhood and that upbringing, I wouldn't change it. It's what made you. It's what made me, right? It's, it's every day I wake up and, and I told someone once that I, I'm really motivated by fear. And it's that fear of failure, that fear of not achieving, that fear of not providing. And I don't know if that's a healthy place. Maybe that's why I'm losing my hair so quickly, but uh, I, I think in general, it's a strong place. And I think it's made me a better husband, a better father, a better provider, um, and hopefully a better mentor and coach, because I can relate with people that struggle in, in their own careers and what they're trying to accomplish and achieve. Oh, thanks for sharing that. I really appreciate it. So the, the, you talk about New York then and your stint there. 
being somewhat circumstantial. It's not like you were escaping uh, anything in Utah, nor were you drawn to something. It was an opportunity with WordPerfect and you, you go to New York. Tell me how that experience goes, and especially for someone born and raised in Utah, what does New York feel like at that time? You know, it felt really cool. Uh, I spent a lot of time in the city and a lot of time in upstate. Um, and it was great to experience a different quote unquote culture. Yeah. And again, I was not in New York City. And when I say upstate, I mean real upstate. So upstate, some people say it's Westchester County or you know, Armonk or those kinds of things. I'm talking Rochester, wow. so up on the Great Lakes. I learned what snow really means. Yeah. Being from Utah, uh, I thought I'd seen snow, but um, I remember pulling into a, um, a Wegmans parking lot in June or July, and they still had snow mounds because it never melts, right? It snows and just accumulates, and they push it off into the corner of the parking lot. And and uh, we, we met great people. We had a great experience. We got a chance to, you know, visit uh, you know historical sites in the area in Niagara Falls, and, and the kids grew up in a little different place than they were before, which was really, really positive. And we, we had a good time, but you know, no, Word Perfect was acquired by Novell, and, and my boss called me up and said, hey, good news, bad news, good news, you still have a job, bad news, we need you to move. So we ended up moving out of New York, and it was a fairly easy decision. After a few years, we, we missed any kind of summer we used to joke that in Rochester, we enjoyed both days of summer because it was either raining or, or, you know, really cold. But we ended up moving down to Cincinnati and then lived there for years. We lived actually across the river and on the Kentucky side. I don't so, know if I knew that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. You had a, Midwest, a Midwestern stint as well. That's it. Exactly. Wow. So we've got uh, a daughter that was born in New York and a son that was born in Kentucky. And so we've got, uh, we got a little bit of a mix there, but we really enjoyed the Midwest, Cincinnati, the Kentucky region, the horse farms, the people. And, and I stayed with um, Novell post acquisition for another year or so and, and ended up leaving um, in really weird circumstance. Um, I was doing well as a rep, doing very, very well. And I remember the Novell VP came to me one day and he, he made a comment to me that just really eked me. He said, you are my best word perfect rep in the business. And that should be a compliment. Yeah. But for some reason, I, I zeroed in on the word word perfect rep, that I felt like I was a, a layer below the quote unquote novel reps. And, 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 and I thought, you know what, I, I need to get to a place where I'm not the best add the qualifier rep, I'm the best rep. And uh, ended up moving companies at that time and, and making a change, but, but we enjoy You know, I've lived around the country. So we've lived in New York, we lived in Kentucky, lived in Dallas, Fort Worth area for years. We lived in Silicon Valley. And I think that's it. Uh, and Utah, of course. We're coming back. Yeah, yeah. Could you elaborate just a little bit more on that comment? I actually had, I've never heard of that, that distinction that bifurcation of Novell versus WordPerfect, was that something predominant back then or was it yeah. just one or two people in there? I think it was predominant. You know, I think uh, WordPerfect, uh, fast forward the history of WordPerfect, you know, they come out, they, they create this very innovative word processing product. Alt F3 reveal codes. Yeah, yeah. Shift F6, Shift <laughs> F7, you know, all the usual things. And um, if you remember software back then, and this will be a surprise for some of the, the listeners and viewers, but they used to sell software in a box. And the box included a set of disks, floppy disks, Google it, you'll probably understand what that is, and books. It came with all the instruction manuals and all the tips and guides. And that box of software sold for $495 per box. And it sold you know, either direct or through uh, computer superstores and things that were out at the time. And you know, WordPerfect was printing money. Well, the market shifted. They went away from $495 box software to $99 upgrades because so many people had WordPerfect 4.2 or whatever the version was. And the revenues started streaming down. And then uh, Microsoft came after WordPerfect very hard with Microsoft Word. 
and there was an OS2 debacle in there. There's a lot of great history there. If you ever want to Google the history of WordPerfect and understand really the growth and demise of a company. But they were purchased by Novell kind of in distress. Mm. And so the attitude amongst the Novellians was okay. superiority. And aren't these, aren't these WordPerfect people really cute? And we are such humanitarians for saving their lives. And, 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 and that's, that happens in business all the time. But it just eked me because I, I was raised on this concept of self-sufficiency, self-determination, and self-driven success. And being as successful as I was and being relegated back to that sub-tier was just not acceptable. So I made some changes. That's amazing. And did you, you continue to pursue, pursue sales and sales leadership? Did you feel you had so much success, obviously, with Camera Den and with Gorilla Bikes early on, so you knew you could sell. Did you see yourself as a salesperson? Did you see yourself as this is my path? I'm, I'm going to follow this journey and see how far it takes me. Yeah. Or did you have other plans? No, you know, I, I, uh, once I got into tech, I, I recognized the selling side of tech was, was something that challenged me, interested me, and that I was uh, capable and I could perform well in that, in that market. And, uh, you know, my first leadership gig came when I left Novell and I was recruited to IBM. And I was recruited into this really cool group, which was a skunk works team within IBM. And they hired the entire team from outside of IBM. We were considering ourselves kind of the anti-IBM. And we sold a storage uh, backup product that worked on Sun and HP and all the IBM competitive hardware, as well as the IBM side. And a gentleman by the name of Michael Mollick, who I always felt was a, a great mentor to me and, and, and really a great coach, um, uh, you know, gave me that opportunity to step in. And, and part of that was a uh, really funny story is we, we came together as a team in Phoenix. And I hope Michael never sees this because this, he'll, <laughs> he'll firebomb my house. <laughs> But we had this offsite he arranged for the entire new team in Phoenix. And we get to the hotel and it's time to start and there's no Michael. And we're like, okay, uh, where's the SVP from my IBM that runs this group? And he runs this group and, and, you know, we're all fairly new employees and there's no Michael. So we, at the time, you know, send an email and call his assistant and say, hey, we're ready to start Michael's meeting and Michael's not here. Well, needless to say, no one can find Michael. And we end up after a couple of hours of scrambling that there were, you know, three of us, a gentleman by the name of, of Mike Biederman, who I'm friends with to this day and respect the crap out of. He's just amazing. And uh, Bob Condon and myself, we kind of stepped up as the in situ leaders and, and took over the meeting and started just doing it, just starting doing it. And I, I, to this day, I don't know what the story was, but Michael didn't show up to like day three or something of this oh, meeting. Wow. <laughs> it was so crazy. Uh, I don't think that would be a good thing to do professionally, no. so I wouldn't advocate anyone no. trying that move. <laughs> but, you know, Michael saw that we stepped up, led the team, and, and put us into leadership positions within that team. We grew that nicely. He promoted me, you know, many times at IBM. And, and that's when I really started managing people and, and being a, a true sales leader versus just an individual contributor. But to this day, I could tell you what that meeting room at the Phoenix remember. Hotel looks like and, and the, the fear and uh, trepidation on all of our faces trying to find the, the leader to the meeting, so. You know, it's, it's so fantastic that you go from word perfect to Novell, talk about icons yeah. of, of tech back then to IBM, the ultimate icon of tech in, in the 80s, 90s, arguably probably the biggest tech brand yeah. so far. Um, something, and I, I'd love to understand what was guiding you to pick these this what seems like a perfect path. You couldn't get any better than these companies. Wow. Something was helping guide you through this and I, I you you are you are too intentional for me to think that this is all just circumstantial. Yeah, this, you know, I, I, it's interesting. I hadn't thought about it the way you're asking that question, but but you know, my my wife and I and our family are, are deeply spiritual people, so uh, we lean heavily on 
on prayer and, and you know contemplation and and weighing the opportunities and 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 there've been many times in our lives where we've we've taken a, a left turn or a right turn just because we felt inspired to do so, not knowing what was on the other side of the corner when we made that right turn. And it's always worked out very, very well for the family. So I think that's part of it. I think, I think uh, you know, my belief is that, that God has a plan for people and, and gives them opportunities. And it's our responsibility to listen and, and tune into those, those opportunities. Um, I think part of it, a very small part of it, is if you comport yourself well, if you, if you do your job well, if you play well with others, if you are acting senior in your roles, if you add value to your boss. You know, I've always said what interests my boss fascinates me. That's my, one of my favorite uh, Frankisms. And if you do that, then those opportunities open up. People see that. They recognize that. And I've always been the kind of, of a person through my career where I never aspired publicly for the next promotion. I tried to earn it. And I did it by doing what I think are the right things in the right way at the right cadence and not constantly demand, you know, if you don't give me this promotion, I'm out of here. I'm, you know, if you don't recognize me that I'm so cool, I'm going on to the next place. I just kept my head down, did my work, added value above and beyond my pay grade. And, you know, as leaders, even to this day, I see that in my team. Yeah. And I recognize those people that do that. You know, the, the people on my team that, that uh, are demanding around, you know, um, the next role or a pay raise or whatever happens to be, I, I struggle just personally with that because I just know that's not me. And I just want to scream across the table, frickin' earn it, yeah. you know? Show me and I'll see you and I'll recognize you and we'll move forward. And, and you know, maybe that's different. Not everyone's in that same situation, but um, yeah, it was, it was very fortunate. And I, like I said, I, my, my, my wife slipped me a 20 this morning and said, hey, just say nice things about me for once. But, <laughs> you know, I married an amazing woman. She's a great wife and mother and now grandmother. And she's always been my partner in these decisions. And I, I've never once come home and said, hey, we're moving to, or hey, I'm taking this job. It's always, you know, let's talk about this, honey. We've got these options, these opportunities. And it's always been in light of what's best for me professionally, as well as what's best for the family and what's best for the career long-term. But, but I've never, it sounds really odd from a sales leader, and so please forgive me, but I've never been money motivated. I, I've, never, I've never taken a job well, I, I, that's, that's true. I took one job because of the money, and it was the biggest train wreck I've ever done. I'll never do that again. It's about the challenge, the opportunity, the people I'm working with. And, you know, financially, it's worked out just fine for the family. We've been able to buy Levi's, not Tough Skins, which has been good. I so appreciate you bringing up Shanna and, I, I, and how important her support for you is because, candidly, that's another theme with all of the guests so far. Yeah. That's, there's this constant reminder, I couldn't have made it, I wouldn't be here, had they not been there for me and helped guide me and, and, and made this possible. And I, I really appreciate how respectful you are for the role that she's, uh, she's played. Yeah, she's and, amazing. Uh, those who've met her, you know, it's, it's easy to see, it's easy to believe. Oh, it's, it's gotten to the point that I almost don't want to introduce people to her <laughs> because <laughs> everyone says the same thing. Oh, it's obvious. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> who's got the brains? Who's, who's got, got the looks? Uh, who's got the wisdom? It's not you, Frank. And and there's some truth to that. I, you know, she's she 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 majored in abnormal psychology. So first off, wow. that's how we stayed together for 33 years. Is she she uses me as a science <laughs> project? But the second thing is that you know I run into all kinds of you know challenging situations with coworkers or employees. And it's, it's great sometimes just to bounce these things off my wife. And, you know, yeah. it, it's been fun. I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, we were at a president's club meeting and we were out in Mexico floating in the ocean and, and a couple came out, one of our salespeople and their spouse came out and said, hello, we talked for, you know, five, 10 minutes and they kind of floated off. And my wife looked at me and said, 
this is what's going to happen to that couple. And she laid out the future and spot on, wow. spot on, you know, divorce, the whole wow. thing, because she just, she just reads people really well. So I love in, in, in a difficult professional situations, I love bringing my wife around and have her interpret. And sometimes I'll say to her, hey, do me a favor, kind of poke it over here and see what you can tell me. <laughs> and uh, she does great work. Well, I'm not going to ask this now because I don't want to hear the uh, answer, but you'll have to tell me after this what she what she said was going to happen to me. I, <laughs> I, she I'd love you. to know. And I'd love to know uh, if she could forecast my future now. No, she loves you, <laughs> loves Anna. You know, we've we've had the opportunity so to kind. rock out to sticks with you oh, yeah. and uh, oh, that's right. Ario Speedwagon and have a good time. Wasn't that an amazing concert? Oh, dude, that's the highlight of my life. That, <laughs> was, so, <laughs> that was so much fun. That was nice. That was yeah. so much fun. Thank you. Um, when I met you, it was an in contact. So we we'll fast forward a little bit to the in contact years. And I remember, I wish I could take credit for calling you this. I can't remember who it was. It may have been Paul, but I can't remember who it was, but you were sort of described as a statesman. And I thought it was so apt at the time, by that point in your career, it really, you were polished and uh, dare I say a bit formal and you know I, I know we don't look like it now we're yeah. trying to be a little cooler even though it's tough for you and me to no one that, can be as cool as you yeah whatever in, in fact we gotta we gotta raise your leg up and show the camera <laughs> these cool shoes it's Friday I'm trying to rock uh, yeah <laughs> no one can touch style like the sand you, you've got style down oh you're kind um I almost wish I could know the Frank Maylett at 20 and at 25 and at 30. Do, were you always a statesman? Do, do you, does that, do you connect with that, uh, that description? Do you see that in yourself? I, I yeah, not intentionally. Mm -hmm. I can see why people would say that. And I, I think going back to my, my childhood upbringing, my career development, what I'm trying to do, you know, I, I've taught my kids something that was very critical to me and that's situational awareness. And my kids, if they watch this, they're gonna go, oh yeah, here it comes, right? Same thing. <laughs> Dad's talked about this forever. But it's understanding where you are and, and what it means. And, and what I mean by saying that is, you know, early on in my sales career, when I got into a room of, you know, customers or other salespeople, I observed, mm. what are they wearing? How are they dressing? What are their shoes? What are their briefcases? What's their watch like? How do they respond? Wow. And and uh, and I built, I built my career around that concept, mm. that I, I was constantly trying to be aware of what was around me, and understanding what worked and what didn't, how people communicated amongst themselves, what worked and what didn't, and I tried to refine that. So when I, when I think of statesmen, you know, I, I think of it more in the animal kingdom. And I've always thought of myself as a chameleon. Mm. And, you know, being from Utah, um, conservative environment, moving to New York, you know, I picked up new language there that I had never really focused on. And I'm still quite good at it. Um, coming back to Utah, a little more conservative. So I try to read the crowd, play to the crowd and play to what's going on. You know, the statesman thing, I, I think, is an offshoot of that. And that is just understanding how to bring all the parties to the table and bring a solution to bear. And, and too often I see people try to do it through force of personality or force of communication or deceptive, devious, backstabbing ways. And, and it, it's just never been my style. It's just never what I've, what I've been trying to do. It's not that I'm perfect or haven't resorted to some of the bad tactics in the past, but uh, in general, it's, it's around bringing everyone together to achieve a goal. That's really awesome. Which, you know, and I, I, I wonder if this will influence my next question for you. Um, aside from your family, what are you most proud of in your career and life so far, aside from your family? Um, this one's actually pretty easy. Right. And it's having had a hand in building the careers of other people. And, and that hand could be a big hand or a small hand, a slight nudge or a fourfold 
for full force push, but it's it's watching you and, and seeing how you, I mean, when we started working at In Contact, you were a kind of a junior member of our executive team. Yeah, yeah. You sat under Scott Welch. Yeah. And then pretty soon you eclipsed Scott and you came on at a full level. And then within a short time, you eclipsed everybody on the EC and you became the, the king of <laughs> the contact. And, and then you've gone on to do amazing, amazing things. And, and I would like to believe that I had a little hand Absolutely. in that in the beginning. Maybe it's a slight nudge. You're just a natural and so brilliant that you were going to get there anyway. But, but I look at other people in my career. And some of the nice notes I get from people who look back and thank me for giving them a shot, helping mentor them, having the hard discussions with them about where they were just a little bit off track and how to get back on track. But, you know, I often joke that, that when you get to this point in your career, and I'm not, I'm not 90 or 80 or 70 or 60 yet, I'm still in my 50s, but, but I, I look back and I think, you know, part of my mission now, and it has been for years, is to raise the next level of CROs. CEOs, COOs, and help them get to a point in their career where they will be that next generation leading these technology businesses. And um, when I think about that, I smile. Absolutely. Yeah, I smile. I think about some of the good things we've done. You, you should, you deserve it. And, and, you know, it wasn't long ago we had a conversation like this where we actually did this as a live conversation and people were coming out of the woodwork to let you know that uh, live as we were doing this. And I, I, for one, want to go on the record as saying, I learned so much from you at In Contact, from, from your statesman personality, from your commitment, from your hard work. Uh, like, you took everything so deliberately and seriously. And while you could be lighthearted it was about moving everything forward. And I also want to go on the record as saying, uh, I will be forever grateful that as I embarked on my entrepreneurial journey, when I reached out to my colleagues to say, can I help with anything? Or um, uh, let me restate that. Can I offer you help? Because that's what I want to be doing you, despite your experience and expertise, raised your hand only because you wanted to help me and said, yes, but Sam, come help me and my team here. And that meant a lot to me because it, it, uh, it, it, it was a point in my career where I really needed that. I really needed the confidence um, of someone like a Frank Maylett, an icon, to say, absolutely, you're, you're good enough to do this. And it, it meant a lot to me. Well, those are very kind words, but I want to be perfectly clear. I needed you because oh, I come on. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I'm a generous guy, and uh, and I think I'm I'm helpful to a fault sometimes. But you know, I'm glad I could help you. But the bottom line is, you helped us a lot, and and I've always respected your brilliance and and your clarity. And we've had we've had some very interesting discussions. You know, I can remember. Right. Times after EC meetings, we'd go lock ourselves in either your office or my office and kind of dissect and, and plan on how we get things pointed in the right direction. And, and uh, you know, again, you talk icons. I, I'm nothing compared to, you know, you. And this is not a... You're so kind. Go you know, uh, maybe we should just hug or yeah, something. We'll, right we'll do it after this. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. You're so kind. Um, your comment about locking us, locking ourselves up in, uh, in in rooms after EC meetings and hashing stuff out, constantly reminds me of the fact that we never appreciate the good old days until the good they're the good old days. Because I do sincerely yeah. look back on those days working with you and Paul and others on the team, Scott, Greg, everybody, with with such fondness now. But yeah. in the heat of the moment, they were such stressful days and years. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it really causes me to remind myself of what's happening now. I'm, I mean, I'm in the heat of the moment with Atlas RTX, and um, it sure seems like it's a, it's a stressful day and week and month every day and week. But I'm certain that I'll look back on this with that same fondness. Uh, you know, it's tough. And you should. I mean, you 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 and Anna and Drew, you kind of birthed this thing, and and I remember when you were three people, and then five and seven, and and your new offices are beautiful and 
the product is really good okay. and you know it's it's got to be an encouraging journey i remember i remember talking to you after you had left um uh, what was the merit cx, merit CX. Yeah, thank you yeah. uh, i know they changed their name they've gone through some changes but you, you called me up we were talking and you said hey listen i want to do a startup from literally Scratch. conception <laughs> and grow it so that I could have some credibility on the mindshare side, on the, on the uh, consulting side and, and, and the investment side. And, and I thought, well, isn't that cool? You know, and, and you've done it. I mean, look what you've built. And, you know, I don't know what your exit plans are. We've talked about them in private, you know, a year or so ago. And, um, you know, if you're going to continue to run this company and grow it to a billion dollars or what you'll do, but, but you've got to be proud of you're one of the few people in the investment community that i can confidently say understands operations oh thank you you know it's it's so challenging it has been in the last 10 15 20 years of my career working with private equity vcs that you know they're great investment people very bright harvard yale stanford penn wharton you know all the usual stuff but they've never had a paper out and they've never had to run a team and fire people and 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 you know you, you're going to have that one leg up in the world that they've never had which is i've done this which is really cool you're so kind that i i better end the uh, Bassam frank love fest before yeah, we yeah, lose yeah. everybody uh, let's but get, I, let's I, get I back give on you a hug that. after this thank yeah. you um let's go to the other end of, of the spectrum what is your biggest regret You know, this is uh, uh, this is proof that I was not provided these questions up front. No. So, I, <laughs> you know, I haven't such a pat answer, but I don't have a lot of regrets, um, and none that that I would say are huge. I I don't know. You know, I mean, there's probably some companies that I've left too early in the process. Mm. Uh, maybe the last, I don't know, 15 years or so, maybe longer. You know, when I come onto a company, I tell the, the board that I'm, I'm yours for four years maximum because I like coming in, fixing things, getting them efficient, making things happen, being successful, getting them operational. And when they become kind of operational, I jump because it kind of bores me. Um, coming on to Instructure, I told the board four years unless something, you know, amazing happens. When I joined Rise Point as their CEO, I told them four years. When I joined uh, Workfront, I told them four years. When I um, joined in, in Contact, and I'm kind of chronologically backwards, going backwards, yeah, yeah. I didn't tell them that because that's where I learned that principle. I was there for four years, and at that point, it had gotten to the, the, the point that we had a good working machine, we we're growing very nicely, and bluntly, I was just not intellectually challenged, and I need to move on to the next thing. So, so not a lot of regrets. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, this seems like a canned uh, question, but I think it will be pretty impactful uh, posed to you. And that is, what advice do you give a 20-year-old Frank Maylitt now? What advice do you give her or him? Yeah, it's, you know, I'm very fortunate that I've got a I've got a slew of kids and many yeah. of them are in their 20s. And, and fortunately, uh, four have gotten into tech. And then I've got, uh, uh, you know, a couple other kids have chosen different paths. But, but the advice I give them is, is very clear. Number one is be a good person. Don't be judgmental. Understand that when you're younger, everything's black and white. You're fat, you're skinny, you're good looking, you're ugly, you're tall, you're short, you're okay. rich, you're poor, everything's black and white. And, and I've shared with you my concept on this is that every year you age, it increases the gray scale between those two elements. So I, I try mm -hmm. to teach, and I would tell a, a young 20 year old at this point, be careful, there's a lot of gray in there. Mm -hmm. And I think we see that as executives running, you know, large businesses that that we make decisions that look 
to some of these younger people is black and white. Yeah. And they don't know that the decision is based on a thousand variables. And, 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 and I can't tell you, you know, countless times, and I'm sure you've done the same in difficult decisions, where I, I've had days where I come home and cry because we've affected people's lives and made changes. And everyone thinks, oh, it's the, it's the cold corporate, you know, and it's not, that's not true. It's not black and white, cold, not cold. It's a thousand things go into this and just many things that, that people don't see in public. So number one is, is don't be judgmental. Be perceptive around other people's decisions and, and maybe why. Covey talked about this in his book a million years ago. And, you know, you see situations where a car may speed by you on I-15 and you immediately think, what a jerk driving, you know, fit 20 over the speed limit. Well, what you may not know is they could be heading to the hospital. Maybe their wife's in labor next to them or someone's having a seizure next to them. You know, I, I've, I've tried to be less judgmental. So that's one thing. Absolutely. Number two is work your butts off. You know, this is not a welfare state and your career is in your hands. Do the work, do the hard stuff. And, and I'll tell you, you know, having again, a, a slew of great kids. One thing that I'm very proud of is to this day, I have people coming to me saying, your kids know how to work because that's what makes the difference. And Absolutely. managers, directors, VPs, CXOs, CEOs, boards, they, they're looking for that strong, strong work ethic. And the third thing is, is kind of tied to that. And, and that is, it's not a free ride. Don't expect everything to get handed to you. Um, your career, your choices, your opportunities, go earn it, be thoughtful and purposeful in your planning and go after it full speed. And, uh, probably another 20 things I could add to that. But, but I think the bottom line is, is really those three things. The amazing thing, Frank, is it's almost as if you had told your 20 year old self these things, because I think the story you just left us with shows your willingness to do all of those things. It's, uh... Listen, we have to walk the walk if we're going to talk the talk. And and it's incumbent on us as 50 somethings, 40 somethings, Almost. behind the camera, 30 somethings, you know, are you even 50 you now? You just aged him. 20 somethings, yeah, <laughs> yeah. sorry. 10 somethings, uh, you need a nap, yeah. you know, milk and cookies. I mean, I don't know. But, you know, it's the, the journey's ours. Yeah. Embrace it, enjoy it, uh, go after it, make it yours, put your brand on it. And have fun. Frank, it's hard to uh, come up with anything that could be a better close than that. So thank you so much again for your time, your friendship, and your support all of these years. I really appreciate it. Love the opportunity. Thank you.